Hello, everyone. Thank you for jumping on and coming to our event with uh, Sawan Tawari. We'll wait a few more minutes until 10.10, so everyone gets the chance to join. In the meantime, my name is Mahak Tawari, and I'm the president and founder of the MSJC chapter of Hope and STEM. We are a club and honor society that dedicates itself to STEM disciplines and projects for the benefit of our community. If you're interested in having an impact on the people around you, please consider joining us or becoming part of us as an officer for in the fall of 2021. We're happy to welcome new people all the time. If you'd like more information on joining Hope and STEM, our MSJC at, and our MSJC and STEM chapter, you can always email us at our chapter email. After this event concludes, we would love to have your feedback by filling out this very short survey. This will help us better understand our audience and release more events in the future. The info is going in the chat below. the what's Now for the event to begin, Salwan Tawari is a first generation college graduate from Southern California who finally found his calling after his time at UC Berkeley. His biggest concern after reaching his educational goal was to find a job that he loves to do. After all, he put himself through such an intense career so that he can have more opportunities in the field he loves. After graduating with a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering in 2014, and master's degree in 2015. He found himself at Raytheon Technologies. Now he loves to develop tactical software as a systems engineer for one of the biggest multinationals in aerospace and defense. Please welcome Salvin Tawari. Hey, I'm Salvin. And um, let me go ahead and share my screen so I can show the presentation that I have prepared. Okay, so, um, sorry, I just, well, that, that was the end. So let me get back to the beginning here. So uh, my presentation is called Setting Yourself Up for Finding Your Dream Job. And basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about um, basically the ways where I think you can make yourself have skills that are marketable across multiple industries and so that you can find you know, internships and um, 
just like generally applicable skills that employers really like to see with the idea that um, there might be a career out there that you don't know about and and you want to be ready for it when you find out about it so that you know you already have the skills because when it comes to finding a job a lot of the time it's not about um, already knowing everything about the field when you're heading in and all of your prior knowledge a lot of time it's about having widely applicable skills that leave people trusting that you can learn on the fly. And so I'm gonna talk about my experience, my nonlinear path um, towards finding my dream job and steps that you guys can take to make that a little bit easier for you. Um, so Mahak already introduced me, but a little bit about myself again. So I'm a senior systems engineer at Raytheon Intelligence and Space. I've worked here for about six years, um, been working here since I graduated um, grad school. Uh, again, I work on tactical radar algorithms for fighter jets. I work mostly on the technical side, but I also handle some scheduling and budgeting things. And it's been really cool being exposed to that too, because uh, you get some leadership experience. And um, in addition to, you know, just learning about the science of radar and how they work and um, trying to design high performing algorithms that help pilots identify targets and um, you know so that they can defend themselves. Um, so I got my bachelor's from UC Berkeley in 2014 in mechanical engineering and then I got my master's from UCLA also in mechanical engineering in 2015 and most of my free time and vacation time is spent outdoors. I really like to camp, I really like to hike and visiting national parks. Uh, Glacier National Park and Mount Rainier are a couple of my favorites. Um, and I really do want to mention that it's important to find a career that gives you work-life balance because um, a big part of it, being happy in your career and being able to do your best is also being able to take time off to mentally reset. And so I do think that's an important aspect of finding your dream job that a lot of people might not emphasize in college is the work-life balance. Um, so as you guys will see, I really, branched off in several different paths before I really like ended up uh, with the career that I did. I, so I started college with the goal of working in the renewable energy industry. I took a lot of theoretical classes with that in mind. I took a lot of fluid mechanics. I took classes about solar energy. I took classes about wind energy. I took um, a lot of super theoretical math classes, um, thinking that I'd be solving, you know, super, crazy equations on the job. Um, but I ended up having a lot of trouble finding internships. I had a really good GPA, but the problem with taking mostly theoretical classes was I didn't end up having that many classes with projects or hands-on experience. So I had really few practical skills to market myself to industry. Um, not to say theoretical classes are bad because they are important in um, developing your ability to um, sort of you know, absorb the science because most engineering jobs do require you to, you know, have some background in science. Um, but if all of your classes are more on the scientific side and not enough practical experience, then you don't really get, you don't really show that you have the capability to um, take what you've learned and actually apply it in the real world. And another thing that I didn't really do in college was seek out opportunities and use university labs to expand my skill set. A lot of um, professors are willing to take on students, you know, and you can spend, you know, five hours a week, 10 hours a week, 15 hours a week. It's really up to you and you can work in their lab. A lot of the time it's for free or for class credit, but it's a really good opportunity to also expand your practical skill set uh, beyond, you know, what you might get in some of your project based classes or, you know, if you're taking a lot of theoretical classes. Um, because that's what you really want to do. Uh, you can supplement that with some lab experience. Um, but that's something that I didn't personally do. I, I, um, I mostly just focused on my coursework, thinking that that was going to be what was going to land me a great internship and a great job. But um, that wasn't the case. I did end up working as an engineering intern at a power plant after my junior year, but I wasn't able to find an internship after my senior year. Um, so towards the end of undergrad, uh, you know, I started thinking about grad school. And so I already, I knew the entire time that I was in undergrad that I wanted to get my master's. 
but that entire time, I planned to specialize in fluid mechanics, uh, which is basically the equations in science that govern, you know, air and like water flow and, you know, and things like that. But towards the end of my senior year, I really started to grow interested in a subfield of mechanical engineering called control systems. Um, this is really something that hit me, you know, I applied to grad school, you know, in like November, December, you know, talked about how much I wanted to work on fluid mechanics and all that. And then it was like around February and March when I was graduating in May that I, like, I took a class on control systems and I really started getting interested in that and uh, learning about the applications. And so I ended up following through with that. And uh, literally the last few months of my senior year, I like decided to change up what I wanted to do in grad school. Um, luckily, the grad programs I was applying to were very flexible, so it was very easy. But yeah, so I ended up following through on my newfound interest in control systems. Through all this, I did still have a career in renewable energy in mind. I started off, you know, wanting to apply fluid mechanics to the renewable energy industry, and then eventually I moved, you know, towards the, the control systems aspect. Um, but the end game, the those entire four years was to work in the renewable energy industry. Um, but once I got to grad school, there were two key things that led me to finding and getting my dream job uh, with that I have with Raytheon today. Uh, one big thing was that uh, my control systems classes in grad school tended to have a lot of hands-on projects. I got a lot of experience setting up simulations, evaluating the performance of you know these control systems that I got to design, and then I got to uh, take that performance and evaluation and use that to try to improve the design and reevaluate the design. And, and, um, and the other thing that kind of coincided with that, which ended up being the perfect storm, was a lot of aerospace and defense companies recruited heavily at UCLA, which again is where I went to grad school. So companies like Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, um, they have a really big presence around LA and uh, around LAX. Um, so the way it all came together, so a lot of design goes into the software that radar use, which I had no idea. You know, I didn't know anything about how radar worked. I didn't even, I, I thought it was just a, oh, people design the hardware and they put together a radar and there's a lot of electronics and that's, and that's it. And that wasn't something that I was very interested in doing, but um, it turns out a lot of design goes into the software itself. Like how do you design software to look at a target and figure out how fast it's going and or what is it? Or is it a threat? You know, is it a Chinese aircraft or is it a Boeing 737 commercial airliner? You know, like things like that. Um, and so designing these things, because you never want to give the pilot the wrong answer, there's a lot of work that goes into it and making sure that it works in as many cases as possible, understanding when it doesn't work so that, um, you know, you know when you're likely to give a pilot incorrect information and you just, you know, make sure that, you know, the algorithm doesn't run, you know, for example. Um, so there's a lot that goes into it because the last thing you want is to tell a pilot that something is a friendly or more like last thing you want is for the, to tell the pilot that this aircraft that's flying towards them is hostile, but it ends up being a friend and they shoot at it, you know, like so, and there's a lot of problems like this in radar. Um, you know, sometimes two things might look like one and like, so there's, and in like these military applications, the stakes are very, very high. And so a lot goes into it that I never even thought about like my entire college career. Um, and so a lot of this design ends up involving prototyping software algorithms in MATLAB, evaluating the performance of the algorithm, improving the design and reevaluating the performance, which if you remember in the last slide are pretty much exactly the things that I was doing with control systems um, in grad school in my projects there. Um, so systems engineers typically do this radar design work and through all the campus recruiting from, uh, from you know, Raytheon, Northrop, et cetera, I got a chance to hear a lot about these positions and what goes into them. And I started to get really interested. And again, through the grad classes that I happened to be taking, I got the skills, um, I got very applicable skills to these kinds of jobs, which made me a very strong candidate. So like after, you know, four years of undergrad of taking lots of theoretical classes, and and um, after taking lots of theoretical classes, having trouble finding internships, not really having practical skills, I kind of just had this like perfect storm where it all came together at the end, with like with who was recruiting locally and the skills that 
I got out of this grad school specialization that I just decided on at the last second. Um, so I was able to line up a job with Raytheon as a systems engineer um, a few months prior to graduation. So I started working for them right now out of college. I've been working for them for six years now, and I love my career. I get a lot of opportunities to work on really advanced problems. And I also have a really good work-life balance, as I mentioned, which isn't the case in all industries. Um, I get to support like R&D efforts. So like a lot like, you know, like developing new technologies, but I also get to work on like 20 year old radar programs where I just, you know, get to work on things where like, how do we improve how the radar works without actually changing the hardware, like, you know, and designing better software um, that's supposed to work with really old technology. And so I get a little bit of both sides. I get to work with, you know, customers like Boeing who are very interested in having, you know, things rigorously tested, um, which involves a lot of documentation and paperwork and flight test planning. You know, you have to test how the radar works in like the real conditions. Um, but I also get to work for these R&D efforts where I get to just like sit in a lab and kind of like do whatever I want for like three weeks and try all these different ideas because the customer um, for those types of projects um, kind of just gives us free reign to figure out what we think is best. And um, so it's cool. I get I, I have a career where I get this, you know, do many different kinds of problems for many different kinds of customers. And I get to work on very important problems that are also very dynamic. And again, it took me, I took a very non-linear path to get here. I started off interest in renewable energy and fluid mechanics, branched off into renewable energy and control systems. And then through all my experience in grad school, my control systems uh, led me into systems engineering and designing software. Um, but now with uh, military applications in the defense industry. So like over the course of like four years, I bounced around, like my preferences bounced around a lot. Um, and so, yeah, um, but again, that path could have been a lot easier. I could have set myself up for success a bit more. I could have, there's a lot of things I could have done that would have helped me get more internships in my undergrad, um, so that I didn't have to get lucky and have all this come together at the end. Um, so I've touched on this a few times. My balance between theoretical and project classes, project-based classes was pretty poor. Um, Project-based classes tend to help develop and demonstrate practical skill sets, and they also provide experience working in and leading teams. Um, one thing that employers really like to see, especially in STEM, is that you, um, you've demonstrated a capability of leading a team um, and working in teams because, you know, it's a lot of, it, it's, um, in the real world, that's exactly what you're going to be doing. You know, you're not going to be just like sitting at your desk solving problems. You're going to be, these are, these are always problems that require coordination between multiple people and, and, um, you know, they want leaders because honestly, leaders in STEM are very hard to find. Like a lot of people in STEM actually aren't interested in being leaders, um, which I came to be surprised about. But one thing that's made it really easy to stand out in like my current career is that there's actually very few people who are interested in being leaders. Um, so even just being interested a lot of the time means that you are strongly considered for those opportunities because a lot of engineers just want to do the day-to-day -day coding and stuff like that. Um, and so employers like to see that if in their interns as well, they like to see that you've, uh, you know, people who've demonstrated that skill in college, which I personally didn't do. And it's something that I actually wasn't interested in in college either. It wasn't until I, um, started kind of getting more responsibility pushed on me by my manager that I was like, oh, actually, you know, I kind of like leading teams and not um, just like sitting in my own box and like typing stuff up. I, lo I like coordinating and I like keeping people motivated and all that. Um, another thing that I did that I wouldn't do over was I really prioritized my GPA too much over being a well-rounded STEM student. Um, I, I really think a good GPA and lab experience is a lot better than a great GPA because again, like for the very same reason that you don't want to take too many theoretical classes, like you really just, you want to take as many opportunities as you can to get, you know, practical experience, hands-on experience. So whether it's the lab experience that I touched on earlier, where you work for a professor for some course credit for, you know, five to 15 hours a week or whatever you want, 
Um, there's also a lot of other opportunities. Like for example, at Berkeley, we had a team called Calsol and they literally build a new solar car every single year and they get to race it in a competition every year. And you know they have an electrical team, they have a mechanical team, they have a software team, and um, and so things like that are like really good experience. And I never put the time into those because I thought the most important thing was having a great GPA and studying as much as I could, and you know not you know trying to get as many A's that I could. And one thing I didn't realize was that you know it's okay to get you know a B here and there, and you know sometimes you might get less than a B, and that's okay too. Um, but there's a there's a balance between you know trying to get the very best GPA that you can and just you know being happy that like you know maybe you know have a 3.4 or 3.5 and personally in my opinion someone who has a 3.4 or 3.5 and all this extra experience from labs or projects or um, other internships probably is a much better candidate than someone that has a 3.7 GPA and none of that. Um, and on top of that, lab experience is a great substitute to internships. For example, if you had trouble finding an internship your first summer, you know, you can, you know, work in a lab or one of these like solar car teams or something like that um, the following year so that, you know, that'll still make you a better candidate for internships the following year. And it can also help make up for a lower GPA, you know, like not everyone has a 3.4 or 3.5 and that's okay because um, everyone being a well-rounded STEM student is important. And if you, you know, find another way to demonstrate that, you know, you are a valuable person and a valuable employee and you, you, you know, your professor in your lab writes you really good recommendation and talks about the great work that you do, you know, that's something that can, you know, make up for a, a lower GPA. Because at the end of the day, I think employers really do understand that um, just because you're not a good test taker or something like that does not mean that you are not going to be a successful engineer. And a lot of the time it's demonstrating really good lab experience and practical skills um, and being a go-getter and that stuff is, is a lot of time, a lot more indicative of who's going to be a good engineer or like, you know, um, you know, lab assistant or all these other STEM careers um, than, you know, who can take a test because you know, taking a test does not mean that you can work in teams. It does not mean that always mean that you can critically think to solve new problems. Um, well, it's a good indicator that a lot of the time it's the practical things that really demonstrate that better. And the last thing that I want to touch on as far as what I would have done differently is that I definitely was not open minded enough with the internship opportunities that I pursued. I pretty much only applied to internships in the energy industry and I probably applied to some less, um, I want to say, internships that I wouldn't have gotten as much out of just because they were in the energy field rather than, you know, looking at, you know, some other companies that I knew offered some um, really cool internships where I would have learned a lot just because they weren't in the energy uh, industry. And, and, you know, as I mentioned that one summer, like summer after uh, senior year and before grad school, like I wasn't even able to land an internship as a result uh, because the scope at which I was looking was so narrow. Um, internships are really competitive. I honestly think um, that finding an internship is a lot harder than finding a new full-time job when you were already working somewhere. Like I, uh, I know a lot of people who, you know, they started job search after, you know, having two or three years of experience and things move really, really fast because you know, once you've been working for a couple of years, um, you've already demonstrated a lot of your skills um, and already have a lot of practical experience. But uh, in college, you know, everyone's applying to the same internships. Everyone's trying to apply to Google. Everyone's trying to apply to um, Amgen, you know, and so it gets extremely competitive. So you want to keep your search as open as possible, because a lot of the time, internship experience in a different field or not a lot of time internship experience in a different field is always better than no experience so you know if i was interested in energy it would have been way better for me to pursue some internships with some automobile companies uh, than to just you know sit at home for the summer um, because then i you know you'll out of most internships especially with a good company you know you're going to get experience that is going to be applicable to getting you where you really want to be you know like i think uh you know 
an internship with an automobile company would have gotten me a lot of experience that could have helped me get that energy field internship the next summer or help me get a full-time job in there. Um, so definitely be open-minded because um, I think most hands-on experience is good experience. Um, um, I kind of want, so summarizing all that. So, you know, I talked about my path to getting where I ended up talked about what I would have done differently. And so I kind of want to like summarize all that into here's what I think everyone should do um, throughout their college career and key and um, skills that they should emphasize. And so I'm calling these the keys to maximizing the number of opportunities available to you. And to me, this means, you know, if you aren't able to get an opportunity in your preferred field, these are things that you can do to uh, maximize your opportunity the next time. These are the things that you can do to maximize your opportunities to get a internship in any field. And these are the things that are going to help um, broaden your skill set enough where, you know, if you find out all these, uh, you know, find out about a new field you didn't really know about, like I did with radar, you have a widely applicable skill set that makes you very marketable for that. Um, so the biggest thing is demonstrating strong analytical skills. And what this means is it's the ability to figure out the right approach to solve new problems and asking the right questions to lead you to the solution. Like I still don't know a ton about the, the um, sort of, you know, ins and out of radar. I know a lot, but I definitely don't know as much as people who studied radar in school. But the key thing is I've been able to figure out what I don't know so that I know the right questions to ask to experts to help me um, figure out the solution. Um, an ability to learn on the fly is often more sought after than existing knowledge. Um, obviously there's some very niche fields where um, you know, specialized knowledge is very important, but there's a lot of fields out there that, you know, that we don't know about when we're just going through college uh, where learning on the fly is a lot more important because they're not so specialized. You know, positions like systems engineering where it's more about looking at a problem at, at the highest level and um, breaking it down into its individual parts. And I really want to emphasize this is not something you're supposed to be born with. This is a talent that's developed through practical experience. And, and uh, I'm going to talk more about how you can develop your strong anal analytical skills. Um, Hands-on experience from class projects or university lab, I've been talking about this a lot, um, especially in a team environment or, you know, those like solar car teams or things like that. Um, having a lot of those will be really helpful. Um, and then again, the open-mindedness and the types of opportunities that you pursue because they give you a higher chance of finding something that will help you get your next opportunity if, you know, you're not able to get what you're looking for the first time. Um, and then it'll also give you a higher chance of something new that you love falling into your lap the way that radar did. And I think it's really important to remember that not getting a job in your first choice industry is not a reflection of you as a person. Sometimes, you know, certain fields are just aren't hiring as much certain years, or sometimes, you know, your preferences just change, or, you know, you learn throughout college uh, that the field that you always wanted to work in isn't um, quite what you made it out to be. Um, so I think if you do all of these, you can maximize your opportunity to get a, a great internship. You can maximize your opportunity in the future to you know, get into the field that you really want to. And this, these will also help you have the wide skill set you need uh, so that you know, when you learn about new careers, you already have a very applicable skill set. Um, because having strong analytical skills um, and demonstrating that really goes a long way to employers because um, they really want to see that you can learn something on the fly because in a lot of fields, you aren't just you know, doing one type of problem for your whole career. You are doing several different kinds of problems that will always require you to learn on the fly because the, the job is just so broad. Um, last thing I want to touch on is just uh, more of a sidebar of just some skills that I believe are underemphasized in college that have actually like really helped me a lot in my career. Um, Excel is a big one because 
in any STEM field, especially in engineering, where we have customers and things like that. Documentation and keeping things organized, especially for like long-term projects, like whether your project is, is a few months or five years or 20 years, like you really want to be able to keep track of things like, and uh, Excel is a really good tool for doing that. And there's a lot of tricks to do things in Excel faster um, to make the time that you spend in Excel less tedious. Um, there's also these Windows terminal and Linux commands, which are also really helpful. They, they help automate a lot of things that you have to do in Windows that, um, that are kind of tedious, can save you a lot of button clicking. And uh, you know, there's a lot of, with any job, you know, there's always the parts that you don't want to do. That, um, you know, like um, making a list of files, um, like all the files in a folder or something like that, which is especially true in like aerospace where like documentation is very important. Um, and our customers ask for a lot of it or because of security reasons, um, dealing with classified data. Um, but the point of this is that, you know, you want to like get really good at this stuff because it'll save time on the less glamorous aspects of the job and um, let you focus more on the reason why you entered STEM in the first place, which is to you know, solve really hard problems, really complex problems. Um, verbal communication is really important. This is true in any company, but um, something that might as kind of gets lost in STEM because we expect to just be working with engineers and, you know, and other scientists. But there's a lot of different dynamics when it comes to communicating with leads or peers or IT or administrators, receptionists, like any big company has a lot of these. And a lot of the time in your career, you're going to have to coordinate with these people, whether you need to get this purchased or you need more hard drive space on your on the computer in your lab or things like that. Or you need to, you know, your boss forgot to do something and you need to remind him. Um, there's a lot of different dynamics when it comes to communication and um, just being aware of all those and practicing those will really help um, people see you the way that you want to be seen. And um, that goes a long way in your career. And the last one I would say is PowerPoint. Uh, you really want to be able to demonstrate the value of your work um, to both leadership within your company and to customers, because it doesn't matter how complex something you're doing is if you can't find a way to communicate it uh, to your leaders and your customers, like no one will, like, if they can't understand what you're doing, then nobody will understand the complexity of it and the value of it. Um, so it's really important to know your audience and communicating complex technical knowledge requires a lot of care and attention to detail. Um, so that's something that a lot of time you'll develop on the job, but I really want to emphasize that, you know, um, definitely like take care and like really try to get the most you can out of those experiences when you are working in a job where you have to um, develop presentations. Because a lot of people, it's a skill that's so sought after that a lot of people make their careers literally just reviewing people's presentations before they send them to a customer and, um, you know, trying to, you know, fine tune their business case or, you know, things like that. So, um, and there's a lot of classes where you get to, you know, work on those skills as well. Um, so that's all I have. I want to thank you all for your time. Um, I really enjoy trying to pass on the things that I've learned over my last, you know, six years in my career and my five years of grad school and, and undergrad. Um, I don't know if there's a Q&A session, but I'm happy to open up to questions. Thank you, Salvin, for this presentation and taking time to be with us. Hope and STEM owes you big time. If you guys have any questions you would like to ask Salvin, please put them in the chat below or be sure to unmute yourself. I actually had one. Um, how long does it how long does it take to get an internship so like in the engineering industry it can take uh it can take a good amount of time so some people get internships after their sophomore year but from my experience the most common was people getting their first internship after their junior year 
And again, it's super competitive. So like you want to start applying as soon as possible. A lot of companies recruit in the fall for summer internships the following year. So you really want to get started as soon as possible um, because the, app, the application process can take months. Again, there's you know thousands of college students across the country applying for that one internship at General Motors, for example. Uh, so um, it's definitely a long process and you want to be proactive about it go to as many career fairs as early as possible, as early in the, in the cycle. And, um, you know, and also just um, be, be resourceful and, you know, look at things that aren't, you know, right in front of you, you know, look at some smaller companies as well, because a lot of people maybe don't realize that the smaller companies are where you might get the most experience because um, you get the most responsibilities um, and you work with like, a lot of different people as an intern versus with a big company sometimes you get stuck um, you know just in this one department and you only work with say mechanical engineers whereas at a smaller company there's one mechanical engineer and there's one electrical engineer and you get, get to work with all of them and get uh, a more broad experience do you have any advice to all of our stem students here at msjc yeah um Again, I think the, the most important thing is just being proactive with, you know, finding the best opportunities for you and, and uh, figuring out what's available to you to help set you up for the next opportunity. I think the biggest thing is, um, you know, realizing that your path doesn't have to be linear. You know, like if you really want to work in a particular industry and get a particular job, um, it's okay if you're not ready for that. It's okay if you don't get hired in that. Um, but just remember that all the baby steps along the way are just as fun and just as valid. Um, you know, some people might not get into their like dream or passion, you know, five years after they, you know, graduate, but that doesn't mean that everything they worked on before that is not amazing or valid or fun, you know, like, so I think, um, I think uh, just taking advantage of all the little baby steps and, and uh, enjoying them along the way. Marcy has a question in the chat. She's asking, when you apply for internships, how important is it that it connects to your chosen career path? And can it be loosely or the, close, the, the closest to your chosen degree? Well, I would say obviously the closer it aligns, the better, but you know, don't necessarily restrict yourself to only applying to things that closely align. I think, um, um, as long as you get applicable skills out of it, I think um, it's a worthwhile internship. I think um, I think the key thing is being able to, you know, if you get an internship that only loosely aligns with your chosen degree or your chosen career path, um, making sure that you market it in the right way, you know, the next year when you're applying in the next application cycle, you know, like, um, you know, for example, when I had an internship at a power plant, I mostly just, I honestly didn't get a lot out of it. Even though it was in the energy industry, I think that like, say like working at a, you know, working for a car company or something like that, um, that had a better defined internship program and like better tasks where I could have gotten more out of it. You know, where I got to work on, work on like CAD modeling or like, you know, I probably still could have learned about, you know, fluid mechanics and stuff like that by, um, because I think I would have gotten more skills where the next summer I could, you know, when I applied for internships and say like, Hey, like I didn't, you know, and I tried to get back in the energy field, I can say like, Hey, I didn't have an internship in the internship in the energy field last summer, but I got to work a lot in fluid mechanics. I learned a lot about Excel. I learned, you know, a lot of skills that are very applicable to the current position. I think like a lot of the time, the most important thing is knowing what skills to market for yourself and uh, doing that in the right way. But yes, I think at the end of the day, like the closer it aligns, the better, but um, it's just really comes down to like knowing how to market yourself if it doesn't closely align and making sure that future employers see how well your experience would be valuable to them, even if it's not in the same field. 
Does anyone have any more questions? All right, if not, thank you all for coming. And as a final note, please feel encouraged to take this very quick survey to help us on future events. Your feedback helps us so much, it's crazy. If you would like to contact us, please contact our NSTEM Yahoo email below. And it's also in the chat. Thank you all for coming. And thank you, Salon, for this presentation. It was awesome. Thank you. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Bye, everybody.